So we, we reflected on the very first night. Last night there was a vigil here, so we didn't get to reflect on much. But we did give kind of a little, um, uh, a little catechism on uh, the original sin and, and some of its effects. But today we want to we want to focus on, and we'll be, fo- we'll be we'll be focusing on this as we go through the next few days on this foundation. We talked about uh, the history of salvation as we look at from the time of the creation of the world, the mind being in the mind of God, and then God creating the world, the fall of Adam and Eve, and then getting that fullness of time, that very center of, of time, which has Our Lady at the very center of that uh, by the will of God. What we're looking at there is a foundation, and so we want to look at today as we want to we explore a bit in the next couple of days this foundation that is the Immaculate Conception. So first, the foundation comes from a master builder, and we know that when we look at, uh, we give the example, Blessed John Duns Scotus uses, and I think we talked about on the first night, the, the master artist. The artist has a, first an image in his mind, and then he works towards fill, fulfilling that image. So first in the master builder, or the, in, the, in the artist's mind, he has this perfect image, and he moves from the perfect image to the less perfect. Now I've got to get a block of stone, and then I've got to get my tools, and then I've got to start hitting the stone. Next thing you know, I've got the pieta. So you go from the more perfect to the less perfect. The builder has the perfect image, or the artist has the perfect image in his mind, and he moves towards the last product of that image is the fulfillment of the image. If we can use that analogy and the way God did things for bringing about um, the history of salvation, then we can also use it for how He sets up a foundation. So let's hear a couple of Scripture quotes where our Lord actually refers to Himself in this way. Like a wise master builder, I lay a foundation. Or I laid a foundation. That's St. Paul talking about the work he's done. Our Lord says, Everyone therefore that, that heareth these words and doth them shall be likened to a wise man that, build, that built his house upon a rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew, and they beat upon that house. And it fell not, um, and it fell not, for it was founded on a rock. Foundation is important. The Psalm 118.6, uh, it talks about, it says, He comes forth like a bridegroom from His chamber. A chamber has to, has to be, there has to be something there. There's, a, there's, there's something founded there. Of her was born Jesus, who is called the Son of, the, the, is called the Christ. Matthew 1.16. What does He come from? Of her. Who is she? She's the chamber. He comes forth from the chamber. The great master builder constructed his own chamber that he was going to come forth from as the spouse to unite himself to his creation like we talked about. When God wished to establish this great mass, that is the entire universe, He laid a solid foundation, an everlasting foundation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. And everything took its root from that. Right? He didn't just create Adam out of nothing. He created him from something that already existed. He took mud, slime, the slime of the earth, and He created Adam. And Eve He created from Adam. So first, God created all the stuff he created heaven and earth. Now heaven, that's um, you know, that's that place of the spiritual dwellings. We don't just mean we don't just mean the sky and the stars. So he laid an, an everlasting foundation. When he when he fashioned his people, the people of Israel, he laid a foundation of the patriarchs, right? 
before he founded his people in Moses. He established them already in Abraham and the other patriarchs. And even before that, you still had the holy patriarchs on the mountain. You still had Noah. He's still one of the patriarchs. So you have a foundation in the people of God that comes to be more realized when God uh, reveals religion through Moses, but they're already an established people through Abraham, Isaac, Israel, Jacob. Jacob was Israel. He who wrestles with God. He who struggles with God. The priesthood that he founded, he founded on the, on the, on the foundation of Moses and Aaron. Right? Two holy souls. And they both kept messing up. And in the end, you know, they don't get to go to, into the Holy Land because they kept messing up. But they were still very holy souls. Who is it that appears to our Lord on the Mount Tabor? One of them was Moses. When he established the church, the apostles were that foundation. Built upon the foundation, St. Paul says, of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus Himself as the capstone. Ephesians 2.20 And Matthew 6.18, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build My church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. Everybody's thinking that's not true now, isn't it? But it, it, it is true. It's still true. We'll get through this too. St. Lawrence of Brindens, he says, even truer, God has made Christ, Christ the church's one foundation. As St. Paul says, no one can lay a foundation other than the one that is there, namely, Jesus Christ. You can't start another church. You can't have a new foundation. You can't have Luther as your new foundation. There's only one foundation, Jesus Christ, and the church that comes from it, whether you like it or not. In all these ways, continues St. Lawrence of Brindisi, God has always shown Himself to be a wise architect. And shall we think this wise architect did not build Mary, this sacred home of His own divinity, on the solid rock of grace and virtue, but on the shifting sands of original sin instead? You see, the Immaculate Conception is the foundation. It's a foolish man, he says. It's a foolish man, Christ says, who builds his house on sand. So why would God? See, this is an early argument from St. Lawrence of Brindensee. They still didn't have. There still was no definition of the Immaculate Conception. Remember, that was 1854. Yeah, 1854. Pius IX. Lawrence of Brindisi was in the 1600s, right? He's post-Council Trent. He's one of those great uh, restorers. But he's writing at that point in time with absolute and utter conviction in the Immaculate Conception and showing here, because it was still a question, there was still the debate. People were still saying, well, I don't know, maybe she's not, maybe this is other. He had the different schools of thought. He's showing through, a, through an argument of the foundation, the great master builder, if he's going to lay this foundation that's so perfect and so many other things, why would he not do it with his own mother? It's absolute absurdity to think that he wouldn't do it. But we don't need to make that argument because we already know. We know the end of the story. But we want to glean something from this foundation. The Most High Himself has founded her, is what Psalm 86 says. And He founded her on the mountain of holiness. Beautiful. That's from Psalm 86. The Most High Himself has founded her, and He founded her on the mountain of holiness. So look, let's look at the foundation of this. When we, when we looked at that on, on, the, on the first night of the Novena, we looked at the history of salvation 
that in itself is like a foundation. There's already a, a foundation there. But in that foundation, I mentioned that we have um, everything that took place, all those, all those symbols, all those types that we see from the time of the fall all the way until the fullness of uh, time when our lady, uh, when the angel Gabriel comes in and speaks to our lady, we have a build-up and a preparation for that moment to come to be. So let's look at the other foundations and how, how, how we see those. Moses erected the tabernacle on a silver pedestal. Solomon, he, he, he erected his temple on a foundation of the most of the finestly perfect, uh, the finestly hewn stones. Now, foundation. What do you care so much about a foundation? A foundation, you know, just going to get covered by a building. You just want to make sure it's nice. And we're going to pour concrete. We're going to stick our handprint in it, put a penny in there, the date, and we're going to move on, right? But King David, who wasn't allowed to, he wasn't allowed to build the temple. He wanted to. And we're going to look at that tomorrow. We're going to look at all the resources that how much he pumped into it. But King David wasn't allowed because he was, a, he was a man of blood. He had to fight so many wars. God didn't want him to build the temple. He wanted Solomon to do it. So King David instructed Solomon in it and helped already get a lot of resources together for him to do it. But what he said was, because the temple will be the house of God, the dwelling of God and not of men. The dwelling of God and not of men. We just don't think that way today. Because if you build a nice church, even this church, which was, was it's just a neighborhood church, but the Germans that built this church went way out of their way because they knew it would be the dwelling of God in the most holy sacrament in the tabernacle and where the holy sacrifice of the Mass would take place. But today, if you were to do this, how many Catholics would actually say that money should be spent on the poor? Who else said that in Scripture? Yes, it was Judas. He's the one that said it. You'll always have the poor with you, our Lord said. And we have to take care of the poor. But we need to build magnificent structures for the dwelling of God. Because men like to have their structures. But how much more for the dwelling of God? So Solomon built that temple on the finest hewn stones that he could find. And St. John in the Apocalypse, what's he talk about? He talks about a Jerusalem. This is in chapter 21. He talks about Jerusalem coming down um, to meet his spouse. And he talks about the beauty of it. The walls are of gold. The foundation is decorated with stone. The foundation is decorated with precious stones. Goodness gracious. That's how serious that dwelling is. That, that temple in the holy Jerusalem. The streets are of gold, and it's so, it's so fine a gold, it's clear like glass. The gates that it refers to, the twelve gates which represent the twelve apostles, are hewn from one. Each gate is one pearl. That's what, that's what Scripture says. Maybe it's wrong, but I doubt it. I think they said they already covered that one. Inerrancy of Scripture. Anyways. It takes that much into that, that holy temple, that dwelling place of God, to give us that example. So in the Apocalypse, it continues to say this in, in Apocalypse 21.3, Behold, as it comes down, this beautiful dwelling place with precious stones decorating even its foundation. Behold the dwelling, God's dwelling with men. God's dwelling with men. He will dwell with them. So this is the marvelous foundation that God shows us in Scripture for His own dwelling. In Proverbs 9.1, it says this, Wisdom has built herself. Will, wisdom has built herself a house and has set up her seven columns. What's that mean? Wisdom has built, has built herself a house and has set up her seven columns. We know that the number seven is a perfect number. We also know that a house that's built on seven columns is going to be Our Lady built on seven virtues. Our Lady was filled with the Holy Ghost 
And what do we receive at, at uh, our baptism? And what do we receive at the confirmation? We receive a fullness of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, where we receive um, especially the seven virtues, which is a fullness of the virtues, the supernatural virtues. So there's a beautiful parallel that's made here. If we look at the first tabernacle, the second tabernacle, and then the final home, the temple, because these are the three dwellings that are referred to in Holy Scripture. They're the only three you really get. You get the first tabernacle of Moses, the one that was on that silver pedestal. You get the second tabernacle, which was in David's own house, in his palace. Because after he heard about, um, I think we'll talk about this another day too, after he heard about all those benefits that, uh, I think his name was uh, Abedadad, uh, I think that was his name, the one that, you know, uh, they were processing the tabernacle to David's house and somebody touched it and then died. So David had him go ahead and put it somebody else's house. But when they saw that that guy was receiving so many blessings, his house was being blessed so abundantly by God, David went back to get it, which is good. This is a, it's holy rivalry, right? So he goes back to get the, the ark and bring it to himself, and he sets up the tabernacle in his own palace. And then the third is the final temple made by Solomon. Those are the three dwellings that we hear in the Old Testament before the Blessed Virgin. The first represents the church of God, which St. Paul says to, Saint T uh, to Timothy, you should know how to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. The pillar and foundation of truth. That's for First Timothy. The second one is a reference, that second tabernacle of David. David's always um, a sign of our Lord. And so it represents Christ in whom dwells the whole fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2.9 And who said of Himself, our Lord did, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. So we have a temple in the church of God. We have a temple in Christ Himself. And we have a temple, the third. Mary is called the house of God. How is she called the house of God? St. Gabriel calls her full of grace. Remember? The Kekari Tomine? Full of grace. He calls her full of grace. The Lord is with you. And of whom the psalmist writes, the Most High, this is Psalm 45, 5, the Most High has sanctified His dwelling. Now that might not make sense to you. Let me just pull it together real quick. So our lady's called house of God when she's referred to as full of grace. Remember, the angel's not telling her she's full of grace. He's calling her full of grace. That's who she is. And the psalmist says, the Most High has sanctified His dwelling. The Blessed Virgin is the only dwelling place. After He says, hail full of grace, that's because the Lord is with her. When she consents, she becomes the dwelling place of God that has been sanctified. She is the sanctified dwelling of the living God at the Incarnation. And besides the, 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 the description of the narrative of the temple of Moses, which we have a lot of information, and the temple of Solomon, then there's the tabernacle of David. And we don't have really much written about that one. You're left to ponder. You're left to meditate on it. But here's what it says. It's uh, from first uh, Paripo, Paripomenon. I think they call it uh, Chronicles now. Uh, first first uh, Paripomenon 15.1. He made also, he made also housed for him, housed for himself in the city of David, and built a place for the ark of God and pitched a tabernacle for it. Then we have, since David had heard, I talked about this yesterday, and it was told, um, 
And it was told to David that the Lord had blessed Abedidon and all that he had because of the ark of God. So David went and brought away the ark of God out of the house of Abedidon into the city of David with joy. St. Lawrence of Brindisi, pondering this, he says, With this tabernacle of David, what this tabernacle of David was like, how ornate, how majestic the Holy Spirit leaves to our imagination and conjuncture, conjecture, I'm sorry. Based on King David's power and religious concern for God, we know only how to build we, only, um, we know only how that to build a future house of God, he went to great extremes. Now remember, he wasn't allowed to. So King David wasn't allowed to build. The te- he wasn't allowed to build the temple. But we can, we can wonder by thinking about everything that he put in place for his son Solomon, who was to build the temple, what must that tabernacle have been like that he would have put together? That, that dwelling place of God that he had abide in his own palace. King David goes on to say, the house I want to build for the Lord must be made so magnificent that it will be renowned and glorious in all countries. 1 Kings 22.5 And that's why they refer to him that if we can reflect on that, that most powerful king, that most righteous, repentant king, his desire to go to the, the absolute extremes in constructing the most worthy temple possible with human hands for the living God. Can we imagine that he's going to be outdone by the living God when it comes to a living temple for the living God? These are why this is that foundation that we, found in the, we find in the history of salvation those symbols and those types that we find in Scripture. All of salvation history, they say, on every page you find Our Lady. Our Lady and Our Lord. Because remember, it's just exactly what uh, Pius IX said. Uno eodemque decreto. They were written in one and the same decree. One and the same decree. So when you find Our Lady on a page, you find Our Lord. When you find Our Lord on a page, you find Our Lady. Because they're inseparable. Just as it was, there was little known about David, so we, 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 we have conjecture from all of this, these tons of gold, the tons of silver, all the precious stones, on how David wanted to build the temple. We can imagine what he did for the tabernacle that he put in his house. He probably didn't just pitch a tent in his palace and they say, that's where the tabernacle is. We can only imagine, but Scripture doesn't tell us. The Holy Ghost doesn't leave that for us in Holy Scripture. Now let's fast forward to the fullness of time. The angel Gabriel appears to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and we don't know exactly what that looked like. We don't know what that, that the, Holy, the Holy Ghost overshadowing her, what that all looked like. That's left to our meditation. That's why we pray. That's why we make meditations. Even with all of this, for so many centuries, we debated over whether or not Our Lady was, full, was, uh, was conceived in sin, and we look at that psalm from the psalmist, that famous psalm uh, 50 in the new translations. They always put it at 51. Uh, it's the Miserere. You know I was born in sin, a sinner from the, the moment of my conception. This is applied to everybody. Then there's quotes from Job and everything else. But everybody was conceived in sin. So Our Lady had to be conceived in sin, so they thought. But since Our Lady was not conceived in sin... All through Holy Scripture, there's that foundation laid of showing us how it is that God would adorn that holy temple of the living God. And of course, He didn't do it with gems and gold and silver, things that we see as precious, but He did it with something that He thought was precious, purity. He did it with purity, something that we don't find precious at all.
And we know that it would be possible for our Lord, of course we know this now, but in that constant debate that went through the centuries, the angel Gabriel said, nothing will be impossible with God. And so too, God said to Sarah, is anything too marvelous, or the angel that spoke to Sarah, is anything too marvelous for the Lord to do? And that's what we find in Our Lady. The most marvelous things that God could do, He did in the Blessed Virgin Mary. We reflected on that the Most High Himself has founded her and how on the mountains of holiness, that's how He founded her, is on the mountains of holiness, the seven pillars of virtue, those things that filled her with the Holy Ghost. If we think about the grace that fills a man, the grace that filled Our Lady, all those virtues, this is what purchases for us an eternal reward in heaven, and yet we would still put all of our value on the gold and the silver and the precious stones. But let's look at holiness. I want to I I just focus on holiness for a second. On the mountain of holiness, she was founded to see the virtue of what holiness actually is. But we say holiness or sanctity or perfection. But what are these? We don't always pay attention to it. Try to look up holiness in a manual for spiritual theology. You won't find a definition for holiness. You won't usually find that. You'll find something that deals with sanctity or better perfection because that's what it is. God's all holy. In heaven they chant holy, holy, holy. Because God's all perfect. He's so perfect, you just say it over and over again. It's like that when you see something that's very beautiful. Women, when they see diamonds. Women like diamonds. They're beautiful. Diamonds are beautiful. And that's why men give them uh, to women uh, when they get engaged. It's a sign of, um, I don't know, there's a lot that goes into it. We don't want to get into that now. But but the beauty of it is something that when it's so beautiful, you'll just keep looking and just say, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Because there's a perfection that's found in a diamond. But in God, there's only perfection. There's no imperfection. Every diamond has an imperfection of some sort. God has zero perfection, imperfection. And so what you find when you, when we would, if we would see God face to face, we would just say, holy, holy, holy. But what is holiness? It's a participation in the, in the, in the divine Uh, sanctity of God. It's our participation in His holiness. That's what holiness is. His holiness and His perfections. And in us, that will be measured. The measure by which we're holy is the measure by which we're united to God. Because if we're participating in in His holiness, in His perfections, the greater that we are united to Him, the greater we will, the greater the measure will be of our perfection and our sanctity. The more we're united to Him. And that's why we see even in, they don't talk about it anymore because it's like an embarrassment to us for some reason. Religious life. Religious life used to be called the state of perfection. And why did you call it the state of perfection? Now you get in trouble if you say that today. You're not allowed to say that because everybody's perfect. And we know that isn't true. We just look around us. We just see everybody isn't perfect. But what about the religious? They're not perfect either. No, we're not. We're not perfect. And that's where the confusion comes in. But the act or the state of life is perfect. Why? Because a religious binds themselves, union, to God. Poverty, chastity, obedience bound to the living God, not to another man, not to another woman, to Almighty God. Our Lady had bound herself to the living God in holy virginity. That's what virginity is. It's a giving up of something and binding yourself to something else. Our Lady chose the supernatural, the divine, even at the cost of not bringing the Messiah into the world. Now, what does that mean? Like I said, I think on the first night, all of the women, 
all the Jewish women felt a duty to marry and bring a, bring, bring, a, bring a child into the world and therefore to cooperate with God for bringing the Messiah. They were all waiting for the promise. That would have been important to Our Lady. But because Our Lady was full of that perfection, that union with God, and that union was expressed by her, her, her professed virginity, by being united to our Lord in that way, she also knew through faith she wasn't giving that up. But she was choosing something higher. The Almighty God, as it said to Sarah, is anything too marvelous for the Lord to do. And Our Lady would have believed and known this. St. Alphonse says, or I'm sorry, St. Lawrence of Brindisi says this. He that is, oh, I'm sorry, that's St. Uh, that's Paul. On virginity, St. Paul says this. He that is without wife is solicitous for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please God. And the unmarried woman and the virgin thinketh of the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married thinketh on the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your profit, not to cast a snare upon you, but for that which is, is decent and which may give you power to attend upon the Lord without impediment. This is what the Blessed Virgin wanted. She wanted that power to be able to attend on the Lord without impediment. Union. Because Our Lady was already filled with that perfection. The seven virtues, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, she had that at her conception. Absolute enmity with, with evil. Our Lady of Good Success said that in this time that we're living in right now, there'd be hardly found a virginal soul. You know, if you talk to any priest about the confessional, not that priests talk about the confessional, but they'll, they'll, they'll talk about in general uh, the, the, the things that are ailing the world right now. Um, the, the things that people do on those phones, the things that people are, are doing in the privacy of their own houses, the things that they're, they're looking at and thinking about and the way people act today, you would think that purity and virginity were things that were horrible to it. We just cast it all off. Impurity is the way of the day. What filth we live in, what filth we accept, and what filth we promote. Yet God is all pure, and how little we esteem this purity for ourselves. Think about it. People will throw away their purity for but what did Our Lady do? Our lady, was, Our lady was offered to be the mother of God, and she would not sacrifice her purity even for that. And you think today what people will throw their purity away for. St. Lawrence of Brindisi says this, Mary herself held her virginal purity in such high regard that she preferred her virginity to the divine maternity. She preferred her hidden life of virginity to the glorious honor of being the mother of God. The highest and infinite dignity. She preferred to remain a virgin to being the mother of God at the, ex at the expense of her virginity. When the angel said, you have found favor with God, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and, she shall name, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. What mother wouldn't want that? You know how it is. I mean, people... The, the, you, you get married, you have children, then your children get older, and then you're looking to kind of live vicariously through your children, at least through honor. 
that can make up for what you did. My child's a doctor. He's a lawyer. He's done this. He's done that. You take pride in your, and there's nothing wrong with taking pride in your children, but you're offered to be the mother of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be good. That'd be good. I'd be the queen of heaven. Even in religious vocations today, many young men and women, they won't enter into their vocation. Why? Because of what they want to give to God. They want something great. And they can't enter into their vocation because they they can't see anything but finding that perfect place where they're going to give something great to God. And in the end, they lose their vocation. The vocation is just like what the Blessed Virgin did here. You enter into complete donation. Complete donation to God. No thought of anything else but I want to be bound to God forever. Let His will be done on my future. You just hand it over. Lawrence of Brindisi continues, Mary did not immediately assent as if overawed by such a, by, by such a uh, astounding divine promise, but asked, how can this be since I have, I have no relations with a man? How precious was her virginal purity. She gave no consent to Gabriel until she heard the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Only then, only then would she let go of her precious... uh, I'm sorry, only then would she give her consent so that she would never let go of her precious virginity. And so we see to what degree of union Our Lady had with God. Being ready at any moment to renounce all for Him in order to attend to Him in virginal union. How fitting and precious is this city of God, this temple of the living God, the Immaculate. If we look at predestination, the quote from St. Paul, one of those that we use for the the primacy of Christ, Colossians 1.15 and following, refers to our Lord as He who is, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Our Lord. Remember, the debate before was if Christ, and it's still a debate, if you talk to some people, they'll still bring this up in, the, in, the, uh, in more of the Thomistic school of thought uh, versus the Scotistic, which is the Franciscan, in the Thomistic school of thought, there's still this idea that if, if Adam and Eve had not sinned, then Christ wouldn't have come because there was no need. But Blessed John Duns Scotus puts it on the fact that something so dignified, something so, so great is, the, is God becoming man and uniting Himself to His creatures, to His own creation, can't depend on sin. You can't make Christ... Christ, the the beatific man, depend on sin. And so we're actually able to to extract from these these, uh, quotes from Holy Scripture. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to kind of reflect on this one a little bit. For the first of every, he was the firstborn of every creature, the second person of the Holy Trinity. But remember, the second person of the Holy Trinity is not a creature. So what are they talking about here? How's he, how's he the firstborn of every creature? For in Him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and in Him. And He is before all. He's before all. And by Him all things consist And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. That in all things, He may hold the primacy. See that? That He may hold the primacy. How is it that He holds the primacy if He depends on sin? If Adam hadn't fallen, 
there'd be no Christ. Really. But he holds the primacy. We know because of the Immaculate Conception, it's not true. There, was, there had to be that thought in God's mind at this firstborn of every creature. God, we talked about the artist. God had to have an idea in his head. Now remember, God doesn't think the way we think. He is. And because he is, he's complete action. He's in action. There's no downtime. There's no like thinking. There's no succession of thoughts. These things don't exist in God. He is. And that's why, that's where our predestination comes from. When we talk about predestination as Catholics, which you're not supposed to talk about in public because nobody ever understands it and they get all confused and the next thing you think, they're, well, that, does that mean I'm going to go to hell? That's not what we're talking about. We're not, we're not talking about... We're not talking about Protestant predestination. Predestination in the Catholic sense is simply this. Because God is, He he is from the very beginning, and He is at at the end, and He is right now, because present, future, and past are all present to Him. It's all action. It's all right now. Right? There's not 100 years ago in God. God is. But he created time outside of himself. So because he created that time right there in front of himself, he can see all at one moment before you live, when you live, and after you die. Predestination is he knows where we go, but he's, he's not sending us there. That's the Protestants think he's sending you there. We don't believe that. Men are free, and he created us free. He just knows in the end how we're going to cooperate with the graces he gives us. That's our predestination. If it doesn't make sense, just know that God doesn't send anybody to hell predestined. Okay, it's not predestined that way. But if he predestined Christ from before all of creation, which the primacy would suggest he did, then what's the what if that's his first thought, if we want to put God in our own box and have him think the way we think, if that's the first thought in God, what's the second? He has to have a mother, doesn't he? Or he's not going to take on flesh. Because if Christ, if Adam hadn't sinned, we've already said it, but if Adam hadn't sinned, Christ would not have come as a suffering servant with a passable body. Passable means uh, the ability to suffer. He wouldn't have come with a passable body because he wouldn't have had to be the firstborn of the dead. He became the firstborn of the dead through his resurrection. He died on the cross. He redeemed us from our sins. He paid back our penalties to appease an offended God first and foremost and then to win for us heaven that was that's the order but if he had to take on flesh to do that he needed a mother and if he needed a mother to do that then the second thought in God if we could say that is the blessed virgin Mary they are written in one and the same decree that's a magisterial teaching from blessed Pius IX on the feast of on the feast of the, uh, the Immaculate Conception, which we're preparing for, at Lauds, that's what's prayed in the morning time, that five psalms that we pray at Lauds. It's a little chapter there. There's a little verse. It's just a little verse that comes from Holy Scripture. On Lauds, the chapter verse at Lauds for the Immaculate Conception is taken from uh, Proverbs 8, right? It's beautiful. Um, and it says this, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His ways, before he made anything from the beginning. I was set up from eternity and of old before the earth was made. What? The Blessed Virgin? Here's the whole, here's the whole passage. That's only part of it. It starts this way. That I may enrich them that love me and may fill their treasures Sounds like what the Blessed Virgin does, doesn't it? She's the one entrusted with all the treasures. She's the mediatrix of all the graces. That's not included in the passage they use for the breviary, but that's there. Then I'll read it again. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His ways before He made anything from the beginning. I was set up from eternity and of old before the earth was made. Our Lady issued forth. Let me read this rest of this. The depths, the depths were not as yet, and I was already conceived. Neither had the fountains of water 
as yet sprung up. The mountains with their huge bulk had not as yet been established. Before the hills, I was brought forth. Because it's true she was brought forth. From before anything existed, Our Lady existed. She was brought forth in the mind of God. There was never a time when she did not exist in the mind of God. But there's also never been a time when you haven't existed in the mind of God. So in some, in some sense, we can look at Our Lady, and she is. We, we, we call our Lord the beatific man. He's the one that shows us the happiness of heaven. He's the fullness of, of the joy of heaven. And that's why we want to get to heaven, to be with our Lord. But Our Lady, and there's some beautiful quotes that I'm going to read to you now. Our Lady, she's the virgin earth. She, paradise is simply a symbol of the Blessed Virgin Mary. From that symbol, or from that, from that virgin earth and paradise, God, you can see God taking the slime of the earth and fashioning the first Adam. How's the second Adam come? The new Adam. The one who reestablishes everything. God reaches down into a new virgin earth and pulls out a new Adam who restores, a virgin earth who restores to us humanity, making Our Lady, I'm going to read the quote to you, making Our Lady the first repairer of humanity. Reparatrix. Maybe that's not the best way to use it. St. Andrew of Crete, now he writes in the time, that's the 6th century, he's writing, or is it the 8th century? He's writing from the 8th century. Yeah, he's writing in the 8th century in Constantinople, you know, down in Byzantine, Byzantia, Byzantia. St. Andrew of Crete writes, um, he talks a lot about the conception of Our Lady in the womb of Anne as the reestablishment of paradise. Her conception in the womb of Anne is already the reestablishment of paradise. One, the, one theologian writes this way. His name is Mal, Malfred, Manfred Hock. Hock. I forget. He's a German theologian, alive today, wonderful theologian. Wrote a beautiful book on Our Lady um, on Mariology. He says this, the immaculate, the immaculate origin of Mary appears as a new being that reestablishes the purity of the original state in paradise. Better still, Mary herself is the paradise in which Christ, the new Adam, dwells. Magnificent. Now, Andrew of Crete, so the virgin earth by which the new Adam is fashioned, Andrew of Crete writes this, in the birth of Mary, humanity receives a new the charism of the first forming on the part of God. Now hearing it, that sounds kind of funny, so let me read it again. Through Our Lady, through Mary, humanity receives, humanity receives the charism. Charism, it means it's this kind of special gift, the special nature, the special character that it's able to bring forth. This charism of the first forming on the part of God. Humanity now becomes that through Our Lady. There's another, uh, one of the kind of fathers of that time period. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll get his name right. Uh, Theotechnos of uh, Livias. Livias. I'm not sure where the accent goes. But he writes this, You are blessed among women. You You truly desirable earth from which the potter took the clay of our land to renew the vessel broken by sin. She's that desirable earth from which the potter took the clay 
to, break, to, to renew the vessel broken by sin. And here's that quote I wanted to give you. Mary is therefore the first reparation of the first fall of our first parents. So we have such a fascination with wanting to go back to the original. We want to see the first of everything. If we find something original and authentic, even a virgin forest, people go on vacation just to look at it. If they find some animal that, uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, but they say the dinosaurs are extinct and all that, right? But they, they, they catch them in the ocean every once in a while. There's a fish that went extinct, they say, you know, 140 million years ago. But they catch one every year. So people want to go and see that because they've never, they, there's a dinosaur that they catch and it's alive and it's, it's right there. I forget the name of the fish. You can look it up. They're, they're, they're huge. But we have a fascination with these things. But for us Catholics, where's our fascination with the fact that we can enter back into paradise? We can learn from paradise. We can imitate paradise. We can take our refuge there. So blessed are you among women that through you we may receive the blessing, the integrity that should have been ours from the foundation of the world. Blessed are you among women because you bear for us the one who will redeem us and save us from our sins. Blessed are you among women, because none is like you, none so favored by God, none so profoundly united to God in perfection and holiness, none so loved by God as daughter, mother, and spouse. Blessed are you among women, because you and you alone are free from the curse, never a slave to the devil, and the only true free descendant of Adam to ever live. And blessed are we when we take refuge in you, imitate you, and love you. For in this we find ourselves acting as God himself had acted. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us who have recourse to thee, and for all who do not have recourse to thee, especially for the enemies of the Holy Church and those recommended to thee. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.